Thanks for joining us today on this webinar. We are going to be talking about the benefits of pet products industry standards. And with us today, we have Lisa Trophy. She is the Managing Director of the Juvenile Products Manufacturers Association. And we also have Joe Graves, who is the Chief Operating Officer at Kurgo. Lisa and Joe are going to be running through an agenda filled with industry standards. What are they? Why do they matter? And how do they work? We'll also be talking about the JPMA certification program, um, the PPFC overview, so the history of the PPFC, the vehicle pet harness safety standard, what's going on today, and what we're hoping will go on in the future, as well as next steps. And with that, I'm going to kick it off to Lisa Trophy. Thanks, Carly. Before I get started talking about industry standards, I'd like to take a minute to introduce myself and a bit of my role with the Juvenile Products Manufacturers Association. As Carly mentioned, I am the Managing Director of the JPMA, and in that role, I oversee our membership, operations, and governance functions for the association. And most importantly for our discussion here today, I also oversee our product safety initiatives and the JPMA certification program. In that function, I work very closely with our standard development organization. I oversee our test lab partners, and I provide oversight for the JPMA certification program, which currently tests and certifies more than 2,500 products every year. And I also represent our industry before government agencies. So that being said, what are industry standards? Standards are published documents that establish specifications and test procedures which are designed to maximize the reliability of products, materials, and the services that people use every day. Standards make products work better, they ensure that products can be compatible with other products, and they safeguard consumer safety. Standards also simplify product development and increase the speed with which products can go to market. Standards exist in every aspect of the life of a consumer, from things as simple as a concrete block, all the way to food, car seats, and laptop computers. If you think about a concrete block, that maybe is, is one standard. Laptop computers alone incorporate over 250 different standards. So standards can be a very complex process, but we will simplify that for you today and identify how standards can benefit the pet products industry. So the benefits of industry standards, as we'll see on the next slide, are many. Um, manufacturers, retailers, and consumers can all benefit in different ways from industry standards and the certification process. And manufacturers, first and foremost, um, can use standards to distinguish their products as being of a high quality, being safe. It demonstrates that a company is committed to safety and quality. It can, again, increase speed to market by ensuring that products are designed and manufactured with these predetermined standards and mechanisms in place. Standards also provide a level of protection for manufacturers and credibility for manufacturers in relation to retailers and consumers. Retailers and consumers both can benefit from industry standards because they are able to identify that products which are meeting voluntary standards are safe. They are the highest in quality, safety, and um, operability as well. So we'll talk a little bit about standard development organizations. There are many. And each standard development organization is uniquely positioned within different industries or marketplaces. There can be overlap among them. And um, we'll, we'll, talk about, we'll talk about primarily ASTM today, but I've shown a number of different organizations on this slide just to ensure everyone's aware of what breadth these associations and organizations cover. Um, again, we'll talk about ASTM. UL is the Underwriters Laboratory, which covers electronics and battery components. Um, we also have ISO, which is the International Standards Organization. And some very specific to other industries, the ASME is the American Society of Mechanical Engineers. 
and IEEE is the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers. So you can see there's many different standard development organizations, but again, ASTM will be our focus today. We'll talk about ASTM a little bit more specifically, but I'd like to start with why the voluntary approach. Most importantly, the voluntary approach to standards is very flexible. It can be a very fast process as it relates to um, the governmental standards process, and it also engages all stakeholder groups. Um, the voluntary approach is able to constantly respond to new challenges and new technology and in new marketplaces as well. It helps everyone who is involved in the consumer product um, realm. We talked about that a little bit earlier as well, consumers, manufacturers. And the voluntary standards can also be incorporated into regulations, contracts, codes, and we'll talk a little bit about that in some, some additional depth as well. ASTM, I mentioned, is the standard development organization that we'll focus on today, as that is the most relevant to the pet products industry and to the juvenile products industry as well. The organization itself is not-for-profit. It's over 120 years old, headquartered outside of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, but with global offices. And participation in ASTM is open. It currently has over 33,000 technical experts on its membership roster in 150 different companies. And most importantly, I think it's worth noting that there are more than 12,000 ASTM standards currently in more than 100 industry sectors. And more than half of those are used in regulation or adopted as national standards. We talked a bit about the voluntary approach, and to expand on that a bit, why voluntary standards are important. Um, the Consumer Product Safety Act directs the Consumer Product Safety Commission to rely on voluntary standards to adopt them into federal regulation um, when at all possible. And the National Technology Transfer and Advancement Act also requires that federal agencies should use private standards whenever possible in lieu of creating duplicative or different standards that are unique to the government. There's also a number of regulatory agencies that could potentially impact the pet products industry. And at this time, the pet product industry is not as a whole subject to any overarching federal requirements, but that's not to say that it won't be much like the juvenile products industry wasn't at one time. And we'll talk about that a bit in a few slides. And I would say I don't know of any industry like juvenile products or pet products that would want to be subjected to government standards without input. But as we saw on a previous slide, if voluntary standards don't exist in the marketplace and the government agencies who have oversight of your industry knock on your door one day, that's exactly what could happen. So we want to be proactive and ensure that as an industry, there can be standards in place that the government could ultimately rely on. Not only does the government have the authority to create federal requirements or federal rules for individual industries and individual product categories, but the United States Office of Management and Budget, the OMB, does have a regulated process for voluntary standards development. And that is that the voluntary standard development process has to include all five of the elements that are shared on the screen. This process must always be open which means any interested parties from any stakeholder group can participate in the process. There must be balance so that not one dominating interest can take over the process. A due process as far as meeting notices and um, public information, an appeals process, and consensus. Um, we hear sometimes and, and we say in standard development that consensus doesn't mean everyone agrees. It means everyone um, will go away just a little bit unhappy. So that is how we know the process is working, that there's debate and discussion and um, 
and everyone has a say so that consensus can be achieved. This is exactly the process that ASTM follows, and we will share a little bit more about what that looks like in real life as we um, talk about JPMA here in a little bit. So a really important question that um, some folks may ask or we hear frequently is that if a standard is voluntary and not mandatory, what is the significance? Why is that important? And so it's, it's really imperative to understand that while conformity may not be required to the voluntary standard by law, it still carries an absolutely lot of weight. And again, in the, the stakeholder groups that we're talking about today, regulators can adopt voluntary standards. Manufacturers can rely on voluntary standards to be confident that their products are complying with the utmost in, in safety. And again, retailers and consumers are relying on voluntary standards to feel confident that products that are on the shelf or products that are in the home are again um, adhering to safety requirements. So we'll switch gears a bit and talk about the JPMA certification program to use this as a, a case study and a real world example of, of what this could look like for the pet products industry. Um, JPMA certification program has over 40 years of experience in product safety and the certification program was born over 40 years ago when a group of high chair manufacturers came together to identify ways in which they could standardize the testing and requirements for high chairs. 40 years ago, um, high chairs were all very different. They were not subjected to any standardized sort of testing process or um, required to comply with any sort of um, safety requirements. And so the group of manufacturers came together. They worked together to um, create a standard within the ASTM process. And when that standard was published, the JPMA certification program was also born. The certification program has been historically built on the ASTM process and it has evolved over time. We'll talk a little bit about what that looks like in the next couple of slides. JPMA and ASTM are two separate entities that work together to promote product safety. As a service to the juvenile products industry, JPMA serves as another arm of ASTM in that we facilitate the juvenile product subcommittees at the ASTM we work to build the meeting schedules and organize the information um, for, the, for the subcommittees and the task groups. And again, we do this as a service to the industry so that we can drive the process for the manufacturers, for the JPMA members, so that it's much more of a simpler process for the members and the manufacturers to work through the process. So overall, the ASTM process is a simple one and a standard is created in just a few steps as you see on the left side of your screen. First and foremost, the need is identified. Um, a, a group of manufacturers, much like the high chair group I talked about a minute ago, can come together and establish that there is a need for a standard in a particular product category. Those manufacturers, those stakeholders can form a task group which begins to work through the process of identifying requirements, identifying test methods. And those key stakeholders then engage a larger subcommittee where that balance can be found with all of the different stakeholder groups so that consensus can be achieved. Um, there is a main committee within ASTM that has ultimate um, voting capability for all of the standards and standard revisions. And then once that process is complete, the standard is available for use in the marketplace. That, again, is for manufacturers, for government agencies to refer to, trade associations, much like JPMA and the, the pet products industry, and, again, consumers and retailers as well.
Now, 40 years ago, JPMA members worked within the ASTM process to create a voluntary standard for high chairs. And over the past 40 years, we've expanded the product categories we certify from just one to 29 different product categories that you see on the screen. We, as an industry and within the standard development process of ASTM, continually expand these product categories that have standards in order to serve the industry. And now, as an industry, the juvenile products industry and our association, we're in a place where member companies who are manufacturing products that are not one of these 29 are, are seeing the value of the standards and the certification and are, are asking for it. So it becomes um, a way for manufacturers to, again, ensure products are safe and we're continually expanding the product categories in which we work. As we talked about a few minutes ago, it certainly can surprise an industry when a regulatory agency decides to impose federally mandated requirements on the products that industry is, is making. In 2008, that's exactly what happened to the juvenile products industry, and it absolutely could have turned our industry upside down for years. But because we have been working within the voluntary standards process and we have these standards created and in our pocket, so to speak, we were prepared for this legislation, um, which is in 2008, the Consumer Product Safety Improvement Act was passed by Congress, and that gave the Consumer Product Safety Commission the authority to create federal rules for the product categories that our members are creating. Because we had that knowledge within the standards, we were able to work with our members, work with our manufacturers, and update the certification program, which prior to this law in 2008, only was testing to the ASTM standards to include the federal requirements and other requirements that were coming down the pike as well. So again, it's so important for an industry to have these voluntary standards in place because regulatory agencies that are um, potentially having or could in the future have oversight over your industry um, could certainly enact federal requirements and the voluntary standards being in place can help ensure that that process is seamless and doesn't negatively impact your industry. So we'll talk a little bit more about the JPMA certification program. And um, the, the certification program is a turnkey testing solution for participating manufacturers. We currently have 55 companies in the program representing over 170 different product categories. There is a technical certification committee, which is comprised of a, a small number of program participants. And these individuals guide the program as a whole in revising testing protocols, ensuring that the program is running smoothly. We test currently to all of the voluntary standards, which we've talked about in depth, as well as the mandatory federal requirements that are in place within our industry. We've also built state requirements into the program as well, many of which pertain to chemicals and things of that nature, and major retailer requirements as well. So it becomes a turnkey testing solution for manufacturers. Um, it takes all the guesswork out of what tests does this product need to go through, um, smaller companies that don't have the resources to, to process all of this information, um, really rely on the program because it, it is very simple and it allows companies to be confident that the products are being tested to everything in the marketplace that would be required. In order to eliminate consumer confusion, the program requires that when a company joins a given category, every model is certified. So if, for example, a company makes high chairs and strollers, and participates only in the high chair category, all the high chairs must be certified. And that ensures when consumers are shopping, looking on the shelf, um, there's no, um, this one's certified, this one isn't. And we do require all certified products are tested annually to make sure that they are keeping up with the changes within the standards and regulations. And because of the program being run by the association and overseeing the Tesla partners, 
um, we are able to verify that turnaround testing for individual products takes about 10 days. The JPMA certification program does work with three partner labs. Uh, we do select those labs based on an objective and fair RFP process, which we do on a regular basis. And all labs are testing to the requirements of the program and providing that testing at a very significantly discounted price, which is negotiated by the association. This is a tremendous benefit to participating manufacturers because the required testing that all products will need to go through can be discounted within the program and, and saving quite a bit of resources for those members. There is also a program administrator, and um, that, that lab is responsible for maintaining the database of test records. So I've alluded to a number of benefits of the JPMA certification program, and um, one of those being the discounted testing costs. We have been able to negotiate upwards of 50% off of the regular testing costs um, that would be applicable outside of the program. The program does ensure that products tested are in compliance with all of the legislation, federal rules, voluntary standards as well, which is, uh, again, a, a terrific resource for participants, especially those with um, limited in-house resources to understand all of these ever-changing requirements. All products going through the testing process can use the JPMA certification seal, which is recognized by consumers and retailers. And we also serve as not only a support system for participating manufacturers should issues arise, but we are also a resource to manage emerging requirements. The program is continually updated as requirements, laws, and things are changing. So again, it becomes a layer of confidence for manufacturers that they don't have to remember all of these things or research these things or have those resources in-house to understand um, these requirements as they change. And finally, as an association, we do have a tremendous marketing effort behind our certification, which is much bigger than individual manufacturers would be able to do on their own. And so that additional exposure is uh, certainly a great benefit of the program as well. And finally, uh, part of the program are the guidance documents and resources that the association creates and maintains for our members to use. Um, that really support the program and, and make it understandable and, and easy to work through. The procedural guide is a document that outlines the program's soup to nuts. The program testing protocols are again overseen by the technical certification committee to ensure that products are being tested to every applicable law rule standard that exists for a given product category. There is a process flowchart which shows in a visual form how the program should work and again a marketing toolkit which is turnkey resources for members to use who are participating in the program. These are things like a customizable press release, um, canned social media messaging that can be customized, and a host of other um, marketing items that can be customized and used within individual companies. So to close out my portion and, and my example of the juvenile products industry, you know, everyone working in an industry is, is certainly passionate about what we do. And the individuals within the pet products industry are passionate about not only keeping your own pets safe, but all pets. And engaging in standard development work as an industry ensures that you are able to do just that. Development activities follow innovation in the marketplace, and the standards development work is continually monitored and individual standards revised on an ongoing basis to keep up with that innovation and to stay ahead of the changes in the industry and your individual products. So again, voluntary standards are of a tremendous benefit to manufacturers, consumers, retailers, government agencies, and most importantly, to protect your brand and keep the pets safe. So with that, I will turn it over to Joe to talk a little bit more about the Pet Products Standards Council. 
Great. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Lisa. Um, as Carly mentioned, my name is Joe Graves, and I am currently the Chief Operating Officer at Kurgo. We are a manufacturer of travel and outdoor products um, for dogs, and I have also been serving as the point person for the Pet Product Standards Council um, for the last year and a half. So what I want to talk to you about today is just give you a little history of the PPSC, um, tell you more about the standard that we have developed, um, about where we are as an organization today and where we see the organization going in the future. Um, so with that, really the group of companies that you see on this slide um, got together. It's a group of manufacturers got together in 2015 um, when we identified the need for a crash test standard for dog car harnesses. Um, we were all doing our own testing and we really realized um, there was a need to develop a standard that we could um, we could all test to and the rest of the industry could test to. So we started work on that in 2015. In 2017, after talking to a number of other companies in the industry, we officially formed the Pet Product Standards Council really to create quality and safety standards um, for other product categories across the industry. We realized that there was a bigger need um, than just a standard for car safety harnesses. Um, so we officially formed the PPSC in 2017. And then in 2018, um, we finalized our first standard for vehicle pet safety harnesses, which we'll talk more about. So the vehicle pet safety harness, I just want to spend a few minutes um, talking about where we're at with that and kind of everything that went into developing that standard. Um, many people have seen crash test dummies for um, for human purposes for seat belts and car seats and whatnot. But when we set out to set uh, to develop a standard for dogs, there weren't any crash test dogs. So we spent a couple of years actually um, designing and developing and the crash test dogs that we have today. Um, currently we have five different sizes of those crash test dogs and we've uh, you know spent a lot of time getting them as anatomically correct as possible, including uh, the center of gravity of the dog so that we're um, simulating a real life accident as best we can. Um, we developed the test procedure with um, CalSpan, which is uh, the organization that does all of the crash testing for NHTSA, um, which is the National Highway Safety Transportation Administration. Um, they do all the crash testing of the car seat. So any car seat that is sold in the United States goes through testing in CalSpan's facility and is tested to the standard that they maintain. Um, so when we set out to do this, we knew we wanted to work with the organization that had the most experience um, doing crash testing for um, car seats. And so we partnered with uh, CalSpan to do that. We developed a standard and really the purpose of that standard was twofold um, and it really it plays out in the criteria that we um, have developed for the standard. And the purpose of the standard was really to do two things. Um, the first was to decrease uh, the risk of injury to a dog and any humans in the vehicle during an accident. And that's really represented in our excursion limit, um, which says, you know, depending on the size of the dog, they cannot um, exceed the excursion limit that you can kind of see in the picture on this slide. So for the 10, 25, and 50 pound dogs, that's 32 inches from the back seat of the car. Um, and for the 75 and 105 pound dogs, that's 36 inches um, from the back seat of the car. And that mimics um, the car seat safety standard as well. The second purpose of the standard that we developed um, was around material integrity. And the purpose of that was to increase the likelihood that the dog um, remains contained in the vehicle after an accident. So what that standard says is in order to pass the standard, um, the hardware and the webbing of the harness cannot completely separate during the accident. Um, so those are the two criteria in order for any harness that is tested to that standard to pass. Um, they must pass both of those criteria. Now, one of the things that we found very interesting and kind of an unintended consequence of the standard is that we've realized that um, the, in order to pass the standard, the harnesses have to be sized to um, the size of the dog. And what that's causing um, kind of as we go through the standards is across manufacturers, across harness types, um, is a standardization of the weight classes of those different harnesses. Um, and really what we see there is that is going to eventually enable consumers to be able to 
shop more easily across um, different manufacturers and different harnesses and be able to do comparison shopping easier, which we believe will increase the adoption rate of um, crash tested harnesses in general and increase the overall size of the market as it becomes easier for consumers to shop for this product, um, which ultimately leads to innovation. Um, as Lisa mentioned earlier, the more you can standardize products, the more manufacturers have the ability to know that if they pass that standard and the components and the overall product meet the standard, then that allows um, manufacturers to continue to innovate and improve products. So where we are with the PPSC today, um, we are currently in the process of um, formalizing the organization um, into a 501c6 nonprofit entity. What that will allow us to do is to add new members to the organization. It'll allow us to expand the certification program to other product categories, and it will allow us, similar to JPMA, to market those products that pass the standards as PPSC certified. Um, we are also in the process of taking our vehicle pet safety harness standard um, and putting that into the ASTM process. So as you can see in this chart, um, we are kind of squarely in that task group stage where we've done a lot of work, but we still need to go through the rest of the ASTM process to turn that into a formal ASTM standard, um, which will then be able to be published and available for other industry participants to use. Um, and lastly, and really the purpose of this presentation, um, besides educating the pet products industry about standards in general, um, is really to assess and to get feedback from the industry around what are the next highest priority product categories that we as an organization need to pursue and develop new standards for. So this is a similar slide to the one that um, Lisa walked through earlier um, with the JPMA. As she said, you know, the JPMA started 40 years ago with um, one group of companies that were developing standards for high, high, high chairs, um, and we are very similar to that today. So we are kind of in the infancy stage of the PPSC. We are today we are one group of companies that. Um, has developed a standard for vehicle pet safety harnesses, but we truly believe that this is a white space opportunity for the industry. And we know from our initial conversations that there are at least a handful of other categories um, that make sense to pursue, you know, sooner rather than later. And we really are looking for feedback from the rest of the industry around what those other product categories might be, and then we need help in prioritizing those. So we know it's a huge opportunity and we know kind of where we are today, um, but we know that we can't pursue this alone. So not only do we want you, but we need um, your help and your feedback um, and your input into this effort. So in terms of next steps, um, really a call to action here is if you haven't already done so, um, we are collecting contact information for people that are interested in learning more. Um, so I would encourage you to sign up. Um, all we're asking for is your name, your email address, and your company name. Um, so you can sign up at ppsc.pagedemo.co. Um, that's the landing page where you can get a little bit more information about the PPSC, as well as sign up for more updates as we continue to move forward. I would also encourage you to start your own conversations. Um, if you know of other companies that you think would be interested in this effort, um, and that you think standards would be beneficial for those companies, um, feel free to have them do the same. Go to ppsc.pagedemo.co and sign up to join our overall conversation. Um, and lastly, in the next couple of weeks, we are going to follow up for anyone that's signed up to get any information, um, further information from us. Um, we're going to follow up with an email, and I know everyone gets a million emails, so we're asking that you please just spend a couple of minutes on this one. It will be a survey email that asks you um, for really simple information, and that is, what are the product categories that you think would be most beneficial for us to pursue next? Um, so it shouldn't take more than a minute or two to give that some thought and respond to it. Um, so be on the lookout for that in the next couple of weeks. And um, we're looking to get a bigger response and really help, um, help us figure out what the next direction is to go. So with that, you know, we spent some time today. We appreciate you listening to the webinar. Um, Lisa spent some time going through 
industry standards overall um, and giving you a great overview of where they exist and why they exist. Um, she also walked through, you know, the JPMA certification program and explained kind of how it works and the breadth of that program and how beneficial it is to the Juvenile Products Manufacturers Association. And then I spent a little time today um, kind of telling you about the PPSC and where we are today and where we see the opportunity in the future. So if you have any questions about any of that, um, please feel free to reach out. Um, to me at the email address you can see on the screen, which is info at ppsc.pet. And if it has anything to do with the PPSC, I will be happy to answer that and follow up with you personally. And if there's anything about JPMA or standards in general that I can't answer, um, I will get in touch with Lisa and we will follow up with you as soon as we can. So once again, thank you for joining today. We are excited about um, what this could mean for our industry, and we appreciate uh, you know ahead of time your participation, helping us grow um, the standards um, organization body of the pet products industry to ensure that we are providing the most high quality and safest products we can for our pets. Thank you.